morning and happy Mother's Day. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Jesus. We are beginning to start a new series in Mark, chapters 2 and 3, titled Four Stories About Jesus. We're going to start today in Mark 2, 13. And when he came out again by the seashore, all of the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. Every time I read that, I go, what was Jesus teaching them? I go, what was he? I've uh, got a couple paperback Bibles, and it's about uh, that much of the Bible is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a little bit of Acts for what Jesus did. And I look at that, and I go, hmm. He's got a lot more to teach us when we get to heaven. It was over 1,300 days that Jesus ministered. And I always always ask the strange questions when I read the Bible. I go, wow. Especially like here, it starts off there. And I ask, what was Jesus teaching them? And I go, hmm, could be a lot of different things. But I know in Mark 1.15, this is where he started. Excuse me. And the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And he goes, oh, okay, guys, everybody that was in the Hebrew that was listening to him, they knew what they had to do to commit. Every time they committed a sin, they'd have to go Leviticus, read the word, figure it out. Oh, well, we got to uh, kill a goat, lamb, bull, dove, depending on how much money they made, and then rip its head off, pour the blood into the little bowl, have the priest throw the blood on the side of the altar, cut it up, throw the entrails out place it on the altar and burn it up. And it's like, whew. if it was me, I'd have to have like a cattle farm out and back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, you know, if we're going to be honest here. You know. Yeah, and a sharp knife, very good. <laughs> but this is what they had to do. This is what Jesus was coming up against. He goes, and he said, repent, just change your mind and then start walking forward with him. Believe in the gospel. It's good news. Everything, probably for uh, 400 years, it was very quiet in the spirit realm with him. So one of the main things Jesus said, that they had to work for God's approval. And now, in Mark 1.17, Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He had just picked Andrew, James, Simon, and John as his first four, and they were walking with him at this time. And they just hung out, and they go, I'm sure every time Jesus said something, their heads went like, what did you mean by that? That isn't how we do things. There's a whole new thing starting, you know. And I feel they knew Jesus as the carpenter's son, but there was a good chance probably that Jesus worked on their boats whenever they needed anything. And Jesus is standing there going, Now, new authority now. I'm changing. I am no longer. He had gone through his 40-day fast already, and he's out there working. In Mark 124, he said to them, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? How come you have come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Right then, he was doing a deliverance. And they go, This has never happened before like this. All Jesus did is spoke, and they obeyed him. And they stand there and go, oh, this is, this is different. Everybody that Jesus account, encountered, he healed. And then he said to him, he took his authority. He goes, be quiet and come out of him. I've tried that a lot. I have. <laughs> Ooh, I was at the hospital. A friend of mine had blood clots in his legs. And they were all scared that they were going to go up and get in his lungs and all this stuff. And I'm over there. Pick up your mat and walk. Everybody in the whole emergency room is looking at me, you know, and it's like, and, and, and there was a few of us, so I wasn't the only one praying for the guy, but like a week later, they gave him so much Coumadin, because they gave him all this stuff that was supposed to thin out his blood, and a week later, they said, uh, we can't let you go, because your blood's not thinning out. Everything everybody feared was gone. It just didn't happen. Then they finally ended up after, I think it was nine or ten days, then they let him go home. They go, we can't, we can't thin your blood out. We can't thin your, and they go, well, they go, well, um, 
Um, we can't. And we're like, yes, we know. We prayed that it wouldn't happen. I got a brother-in-law right now that's going through um, bone marrow transplant. And they said he was going to have all kinds of stomach problems through the process. And I'm there like myself and my sister. And we're bo both praying and praying and praying. Nope, he's not going to have not one stomach. Not. And the nurses kept coming in there telling my sister, yeah, he's going to have stomach problems. He's going to have stomach. No, he's not. No, he's not. And I kept telling my sister, my other sister, tell him he's not going to. And he's like 50-some-odd uh, days after his transplant, and he still hasn't had a stomach problem. And they're like, because we took authority. If they're in, we take authority. Because Jesus gave us the example. And he said to them, see that you say nothing to anyone. This is right after he cleansed the leper. But go your, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses has commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely, and the news spread all around to the extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. But staying out in an unpopulated area, they were coming to him from everywhere. So more than anything else, they couldn't get away from him. They knew it's been really dry spiritually, and Jesus came, and he started ministering to them. And all of a sudden, everybody got really excited. And I mean, they did this without the Internet. And I'm like, Wow. You know, it's like, really? Because you think about it, the only thing they had is word of mouth. That's it. And Jesus goes, he's the one that has the authority, that his word of mouth changes everything. And we have to stand on that. that that's the key more than anything else, anything and everything we do. We just stand there and go, okay, God, they are not going to win. The enemy is not going to win. And you keep, the enemy is not going to win. And the enemy doesn't win. He can't. He cannot. He cannot. He cannot. And then we just skip the big area. I don't know why in the Bible they leave out places. Mark did. He said, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. Matthew got up and followed him. And I'm thinking about that. He was a tax collector. He could have... I don't know how big the city that he was in charge of, but because of that, all the money, extra money, he had to give Rome so much money for his taxed area. All the extra money that he collected was his. So he could go to everybody, hey, Corey, I want an extra 10 bucks this week. Oh, yes. oh you did, oh, I want 15. Oh, oh, you're smiling still, I want 20. Oh, 25, okay, there you go. I hit it, $25 bothers him. Anybody need 20 bucks, see Corey? But it's like, and this is what they do. This is what they would do. The more money the tax collectors could collect, they got it. It was their money. So that kind of gets us a little bit excited. And more than anything else, he said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. With the same authority, Jesus said, follow me. And what the biggest part about that is, what is Jesus saying to you now? Follow him. I know we're... Probably, I don't know, I won't judge. Most of the people here are Christians. They're in church on Mother's Day. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. But what percentage are you following him? Mm, it's like when I was, I'm typing this, and I'm going, ooh, it's convicting me. It's like, ooh, what percentage am I following? And I started figuring, the more you think about it, there's one thing about Jesus. He can only forgive what you give him. As you're following him, he can only, there's always little sparks in their heart. I go to jail and minister a little bit, and we talk to the guys, and they say, I tell them, I go, he, he'll only forgive what you give him. You know, they're always hiding stuff or think they're hiding stuff from God. That's like, doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. He wants you to follow him 100%. But it's like, okay, how much do I really, really, really want to give him then? And when you hear it and you hear it, in Mark 1.15, he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We are so blessed that we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, in any version that we want. I was uh, looking the other day, and it was a Hawaiian version. A young guy was showing me. Oh, I'm really, whew, I didn't even understand it. But it's like we have so much. 
Jesus started off his ministry in Matthew 4, 17. He said, right before even he went through the Beatitudes or anything, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He's striking a part in our hearts where we have to change the way we're thinking. And the big problem with that is being Christians, we think there's nothing. Hey, I'm good to go. I'm good. <laughs> Speaking of jail, I just thought of it. We go to a unit and there's like 96 guys there. And we're trying to come on out, come on out, come Bible study, you know. And probably uh, 10 or 15% of the guys, I'd walk up to them and go, hey, come on, let's go, let's go, come on. And the guy looks at him and goes, I'm good. And I'm you know, like, okay. I, said, I lean down, I get close to him, I go, do you know where you are? You're in jail. <laughs> Something happened. You're not that good. I can tell, you know. But it's like everybody's, they have a lot to be in denial for. But we're, we're all in denial to a degree. We're all in denial. It's like, how good are we? And it's like, we have to stand and go, okay, God, I'm going to give it up. You know, we have, to, we have to give God all the time that he needs, you know. How much more do you know about the kingdom compared to last year? How much more do you know? Now, I'm not talking church or anything. Just the, the kingdom of God. How much more do you know about that? What have you discovered on your own about the kingdom of God? And it's like you go, huh. Oh, that's a good, a lot of people are in neutral in the kingdom and they just stay there. And it's like, whew, they're not growing, but they're, they're keeping what they got, but they're not going, wow, what could, I, how that, is that going to stretch me? What do I have to learn? And, and every time I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then when I get done, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And every time I do it, God gives me more stuff because he knows there's part of me that's not of him. And I, I admit that. I go, okay, God, I give up. I give up. I surrender. And he goes, okay. And he puts his finger on one little area. And then you sit there and you cry for a while. And Because don't be afraid to get emotional with God. Do not be afraid. Because God will touch your heart and things will change. And then he lets you get emotional because he wants you to remember the experience that you're having more than anything else. God gives us these experiences. As for me, every time I get to minister, God teaches me to make a special time to get taught. Not to teach, not to look, not to read, but just a special time for him to teach me something. So I can go, okay, God, what do you got? What do you got? I say, what do you got, God? I'm not afraid. I mean, God's big. What do you got, God? And being really good Christians, we figure we got it all. Uh, nah, wrong. How much more are we following him? How much more are we following him? And he got up and he followed him. He got up and he followed him. And it's like, okay, we're following. Years ago, I had a friend of mine, a young lady. She went over to Tampa. They were having some Christian crusade. And their question was, are you a follower or are you a fan? And we have to make those choices. Are you a follower of Jesus or are you a fan? Fans just sit there and cheer the whole crowd on. A follower goes and does something with what they got. So we have to make a choice. Am I going to be a follower or a fan? And I go, I want to be a follower. I really do. Mark 2, 15. And as it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. Boy, I'd like to be there. I don't know. Can you imagine having dinner? Jesus. His four disciples at the time, and nothing but the tax collectors and the sinners. What kind? What, what were, I go? What kind of sinners were they? You know, uh, uh, tax collectors. They were not the most popular people because they would just you know aggravate everybody for more money. But the sinners. I've thought about it a little bit, and I don't know. What are they? Drug dealers? What? Are, what are they? Huh? What do you hate the most? Jesus went and had dinner with them. Would we? You know, it's like, ooh. But this is what he did. His goal was to reach people that nobody else would. I mean, none of the Hebrew people. Oh, my. When you were a little bit off or you were a leper or whatever, you had to run around in Israel going, unclean, unclean. Jesus went and touched the leper, and he was clean again. And they followed him. And they followed him. As we read, Jesus was getting to know them. 
I like to get to know people too. That you know, a few people that we minister to in the jail, they they look at us. Some guys I've seen three times, four times, and it's our goal. It's Goodman. The guy guy came out last week. I didn't say his name, and and he goes, "Oh, Mike, I've been missing." And I go, "Yeah, I've been missing you too, man. Where are you?" And he goes, "Oh, I was upstate in prison. They got me down here on new charges, you know." And it's like. Oh. There's so many people going through the washing machine and coming out not clean. We have to make a way. We just sang the song, Waymaker. Jesus makes the way for them. Yeah. He really does. And, and you sit there, and, you know, I will repeat it. A lot of people, um, we minister with the homeless a bit. And uh, a lot of people go, a few people, I won't say, say that in general, have said to me, gee, you can get a homeless person to pray the salvation prayer anytime you want. I go, I'll pray it with them a thousand times until it sticks. I will. Because you know why? If they'll do it, if they'll do it, I go, I'm getting them a step closer. I'm getting them one step closer. And it doesn't matter if they're the stinkiest homeless person or a person at the bank or whatever. They still need Jesus. They still need Jesus. And this is, this is the key. Through this whole mark here, it's they followed him. They followed him. We were over at Home Depot in Pompano, my wife and I, who cooks for the homeless. Thank you, honey. And uh, we were just buying a few lights or something, light bulbs or something. And the guy next to us in a, in a van goes, oh, hi, Mike. Da -da 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 -da. He was all excited. He thought I had food still. <laughs> I said, no, sorry, nothing. We just feed on Saturdays when the soup kitchen in the um, Broward Outreach is closed on Saturday. So we, we get to feed then. But every time anybody in Pompano in that area sees us, and then we pull down the street by 3rd Avenue, and there was a whole bunch of guys. Hey, hey, hey. I go, sorry, we're not feeding. I go, hell, here's my, she's the one that does the cooking for you. And she goes, and they go, hey. remember that, hun? Yeah, she goes, she's embarrassed. But that's okay. I want, I want to be embarrassed for feeding the homeless. I want people to embarrass me for it. You know, I do. But whatever you do, no matter who you talk to, it's building a relationship with them. And once we build the relationship with them, then they might listen a little. I mean, 60 to 70% of the people that we minister to are mentally distraught. So we pray, we pray in Jesus' name a lot. You know, whether I'm screaming it out loud if I just get to know them and stuff, you know, I try to pray under my breath and Lord Jesus, change their minds. That's what Jesus came to do. He goes, repent and change your mind. And if they only make one little click at a time, I'm happy. Make that one little click. And then see them next week, make that little click. Yep, amen. In Mark 2, 16, when the scribes and Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with the tax collectors, the sinners, the human traffickers? Great question. You know, they were really, why, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Come on. I mean, those people were foul. They stole from our people, and they did all kinds of bad things. They put people into slavery. They put people that didn't pay their taxes enough or didn't pay enough to the loan keepers in jail. And Jesus goes, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and I'm going to meet with every one of them. And I'm going to tell them to repent. They had to change. I mean, look what they did to Zacchaeus. He climbed up the tree. He really wanted to see Jesus. Jesus was that well known when it comes to that story that all of a sudden he's up in a tree and he goes, Zacchaeus, I'm eating at your house tonight. And then he paid back seven times. I think it was seven times. He paid him seven times what he took from everybody. It's like Jesus moves on people's hearts and they change. Yeah. We have to make the choice. Are we going to follow him or not? Or are we going to follow him? The Hebrew people, they didn't like that. But here, the kingdom of God is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Jesus never broke a law. They went in there. The Hebrew people thought he was by associating with people that did not know him and people he was trying to win into the kingdom. And Jesus said, hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a physician, but those that are sick. 
I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Phew. I'm glad he called me. I was in that category. Oops. I'm still in that category. I have to go to Jesus every day. <laughs> we'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> I tell you the same way. This is Luke 15, 7. I tell you in the same way. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Oh, my. I'm in here in a room full of Christians. How much rejoicing are we going to make in heaven today? Ooh, angels, they can't be redeemed. When an angel sins, they're out. That's it. We're redeemed, so they're, they're in astonishment. That Jesus gave his life so we could be redeemed. And then, and then here's the thing. What do you need to repent of? That's the question today. What do you need to repent of? Each person's personally got something that they're not doing or something they should be doing. Or in some way, shape, or form, we're not doing what we should and we need to repent. Because Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. One of the big things that people need fear, fear. Fear is a big one. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Sometimes I, we do a bit of evangelism out, uh, treasure hunt, we call it. And we go in and talk to people and, until I like to get to the first one and talk to them about it. And so my stomach's like butterflies and stuff. People go, oh, Mike, you're so. I get scared just like everybody else. It's just taking that one step. And then he said, follow me. Follow me. And if we follow him, that one step is going to have to be a faith-filled step saying, Lord, I'm going to work in your authority, and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Sometimes you get people, and they just, they make, I say to them, it's real easy. I go, hey, my main goal is that you get to go to heaven. And then they make a decision right there whether they're going to talk to me. It's not long. It's not intense. I'm not harassing them. But they know where I'm going to stand. My goal is that you get to go to heaven. And then it's their choice. I did what he told me to do. I am not here to call out your sins. I am here to say, follow him. Follow him. That's not hard to do. Follow him. We come up there. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 12, 1. It says, help, help. I need help, Lord. Lord, I need help, help, help. We, uh, Sue and I just took a trip, and um, we went on an economy airline. That's what you'd call it. And after we buy the tickets and everything, then they go, oh, do you have any baggage? I go, oh, I don't have any baggage. You know, and then I go, honey. She goes, yeah, we got baggage. I said, oh, okay, good. And they go, well, for this baggage, it was $30. And this bag was 35 And then even a little smaller one, that one's only, t- I go, man, you guys are charging an awful lot for baggage. And I go, hmm. And God goes, how much baggage are you carrying, Mike? And I go, ooh, a lot of us are carrying baggage that we're paying for and that we don't even know it because we've been carrying it so long. And it's like, ooh, God, an airline is giving me messages now when you travel. And it's like, how much baggage do we have? And that we've carried for a long time. And then the bigger bag costs you more money. And it was funny. The people were there like, well, if you wait until the last, you have to make a decision today on how much bags you got. And I'm like, he goes, well, if you do it on the last day or the day you fly, it's going to charge you even more. And I'm now like, wow, the more baggage you have, the longer you have it, the more it's going to cost you. And I'm like, Jesus came to set the captive free. Jesus came. I go, this is, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I go, nah, it feels like baggage at times. And we have to figure out, God will tell you what your baggage is. He is very open to that. You go, God, what do I need? When you, when you start studying, you start reading the word, all of a sudden God will bring it right up to the surface. Go, oh, how does this look? And you're like, oh, doesn't feel very good, God. One thing I do know is how to get rid of sin. It's a very easy process. Read the Bible. God will help you out through it. In um, 1 John 1, 1.8. It says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So that means we all have sin to get rid of. (laughs) And I like that because then we'll get clean. We will get clean. In 1 John 1, 9, 
Jesus goes a little deeper. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. That is an unlimited forgiveness package. If we say, we get up there with Jesus, and he's dealing with us on some issue, and he'll say, and then you have to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people around that are Christians, quote, quote, Christians, and they're not. We're just, you know, sometimes they get too holy, too religious, and <clears throat> we don't believe Jesus. We don't. We figure we don't have to. We've been a Christian for a long time, and we just have to just mosey our way into the kingdom. God wants us to mosey our way into the kingdom clean. My question is, who can remember all the sins they committed yesterday? Yep, that's a response I get all the time, so don't feel bad. It's just a question I ask. So Jesus has a bonus on this verse. It says, he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess the sins that we remember, he will take care of the ones that we don't. He'll bring righteousness to us. We, just, we can't deny it. Lord, I'm in trouble, and I need help. I got up. Yeah, I got up. I'm in trouble. I need help. You just know that every day, and we go to him humbly and go, God, I, I need your help. Right here in 1 John 1.10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So twice, John the Apostle, at the beginning and at the end of, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he knows we're going to deny it. We're going to say, I'm good. I'm good. Look at me. See this? <clears throat> a nice man. So cute. My wife dresses me well. <laughs> All she does is pick out the clothes. That's dressing me well, dear. But it's, it's just like, that is a weakness of mine. You know, what, you know what? When we are weak, we can get strong. So she lines them up in the closet. I go, okay, those two I wear. She goes, yes. <laughs> but we, it's figuring it out. It's figuring out. That's her strength, right? That's her strength. Find somebody. If you think you're weak in some area, talk to somebody, and they will help you because they, they're probably not weak in that area. Because I know. I've talked to them. They go like, oh, man, I'm just struggling through this. And they go, oh, I used to, but I'm over that now. I used to have a sciatic problem. I don't have a sciatic problem anymore. I'm praying against that one because I know the one that's given me authority. And we stand and go, I got the authority over that. People go up to you, oh, I got a sciatic problem. Nope, not anymore. And you pray for him and it goes away. This is what God has called us to do. That's why he wants us clean. He says, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. This way we can have clear-headedness and we can hear him. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, he says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. Ooh, the goal is not to sin. When I explain this to people, they go, oh, boy, that means I can sin as much as I want. As long as I say I'm sorry, I go, yeah, you can, but Jesus might have a word with you. Like, definitely. But the goal is not to sin. The goal is not to sin. The one, I love the Apostle John. He goes, my little children. Anybody that calls me a little kid, I like them. I'm writing this to you so you may not sin. If anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So we've got an advocate with the Father. The Father sits on the throne in heaven. Jesus stands in front of him, and then he sees us. Because God sees us through Jesus. Pure, clean, holy. And I'm not, every time I think about that, I go, oh, man, because I know, I know. I examine myself on a regular basis, and I go, oh, God, thank you for Jesus. You changed, you changed everything. And it also says, is he is our propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. In Hebrews 4.12, there's a tone change. It says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, both the joints and the marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. God takes a sword double-edged sword, sharper than anything. And he goes, I, I want to cut it away. I want to cut it away. I want, I want to, not just a little, I want to cut it away so it's never going to come back and bother you again. And then he says, 
There's no hidden creature. There's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him who we must give an account. And I'm like, oh, my. We can't get away with it either. <laughs> we think we are. That's the deception where we think we can get away with it. You can't. We cannot get away with it. Jesus says, the word is sharp and active. When I read it online, this, when we get rid of the rewards, get rid of the sin, the rewards are gigantic. That's the plus part. In um, Revelations 22, 12, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. And I look at that, I go, man, Jesus has rewards for us that we are never, 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 never going to realize here. But for eternity, we will have them. Every once in a while, I look at this thing, from this page from NASA, and they just discovered a whole, another whole new galaxy out past the Milky Way and this stuff. And it's got a little black hole in it. And they're like, oh, look at this that we found. And I'm like, you're never going to get done examining them. You're never. They will be discovered forever and forever and forever. And the one that created all these galaxies, it was like 250,000 light years away, is the one that's going to reward us for saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus paid for every sin that we'll ever commit 2,000 years ago. And now we have to agree that he did it. And that's the hardest part when we go, Lord, I humble, Lord, I humble myself. I know that you followed me, and now I want to follow you. He's following us around and asking us, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? You know, and then we go, oh, yeah, okay. I, I got that how you doing from God a lot. I can, I can figure that one out really quickly. He goes, how you doing? Go, uh, answer Jesus the truth when he asks you those questions. It just makes it, makes it so much easier. One of the biggest things that we can do, I know people will hear and remember things from this message. The biggest thing we can do is repent. Confess, follow him, and get rewarded with eternal rewards. This, this is what will change our whole life. To be able to stand there and do this. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, Lord, I'm really sorry. And then you go, okay, you follow him. Follow him. When we confess our sins, he goes, follow me. Follow me, and I will reward you. He, he's got, it's not like we're doing this just for nothing. He says he's got rewards for us that will go on for eternity. So, Lord, thank you for that. Come in your power and come in your presence Hallelujah. right now. We thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. Would you give it up for Mike this morning? Thank you, Mike. Mike sharing this morning. Pastor Carl's not feeling well. If you keep him in your prayers, um, he's uh, he had a cold or a flu, right, this week. He's, 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 yeah, it's a flu. He's not feeling good. But if you would stand with us, if you would stand with us this morning, you know, um, as, as Mike was talking, as he was, as, as, as he was sharing, you know, I was just encouraged to go to Jesus and just ask for a, just a soft heart, you know, a, a soft heart towards the things of God, a soft heart towards the conviction of Holy Spirit. You know, I remember, I remember when I got saved and I was, I was 19 years old and I was living a wicked life, man. I was, I was not going anywhere good. Um, and I, gr I grew up in church and I knew Jesus. I knew who he was and I was just convinced I was going to hell and there was nothing I could do about it. And I showed up at this church right here and the power of God touched my life and I was never the same again. And, I, and I'll tell you this, every single week for like the first, I, it was like a year, God dealt with something in my heart. Something that, that, I had, that I had been, that baggage that Mike was talking about. Something that I had been carrying with me. And maybe you're carrying some baggage with you today. Maybe you don't even know Jesus. Maybe you're at a place where your, your heart is hard and, and it's hard to ask for forgiveness. It's hard to repent. It's hard to go to God. If our ministry team would come forward right now, I, we're going to have people up here praying. And uh, if that's you today, maybe you're walking around with a little bit of baggage. Maybe there's just some things that are coming to the surface and you know that God wants to deal with those things. I don't know. Come and get prayer before you leave today. Come con confess something to somebody. Let somebody pray for you. Amen. Hey, let's give it up for all the moms in the room. 
take a mom out to lunch today. Take your mom out to lunch today. Or just bless a mom real good. Call your grandma. Call your aunt. Let them know you love them. Amen. Hey, when we love you guys, we have some refreshments and beverages out there for, uh, for Mother's Day. So you can go and, and have something to drink or something to eat. We hope you have an amazing Sunday, and we'll see you next week. Say hello to someone you don't know, and let's give it up for Jesus one more time. Come on. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.